Welcome, and thank you for joining me on this episode of Brains Bite Back, where we explore the intersection of technology, innovation, and real world challenges. I'm your host, Eric Espinosa, and today we're diving into a topic that touches all of us at some point in our lives. Inheritance and the difficult process of managing a loved one's finances after they pass away. Those who have experienced it would agree that time takes on a new meaning, whether that's time spent with your loved one or time spent grieving. So Saeed Kian, the CEO and co-founder of Ribbon, joins me to talk about how his company is looking to give that time back to families by limiting the hours spent completing paperwork, visiting financial institutions, and making multiple calls. Saeed's journey to creating Ribbon is a personal one. The loss of his father introduced him to an outdated process he encountered while dealing with money matters following his father's passing. We'll hear how his frustration led to a solution that's not only changing how families navigate the financial obligations of a loved one, but also providing significant value to credit unions by creating a process that's prepared, efficient, and empathetic. So stick around for an important conversation on how technology can make one of life's hardest moments a little easier. I'm Saeed Kian. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Ribbon, and we're the inheritance platform for credit unions. So I'm delighted to have you join us for this episode of Brains Bite Back. We love connecting with founders, and from my experience of doing this, and I think historically, a lot of ideas for founders are kind of born out of personal experience. That's the case with you and Ribbon, can you talk a little bit about your your story? Um, I know it's a little bit personal, but it but it did give uh, you know that path towards uh, that you're on right now with Ribbon. Yeah, I, I know, I'll share my background and kind of how it all led together. So uh, I'm the first in my family born in the U.S. My parents, um, you know, escaped the the Iranian Revolution uh, and moved to the U.S. So I was born in the East Coast, raised there, and. After graduating um, pretty quickly, I, I moved abroad. I went to Southeast Asia. Um, I started off my career doing, you know, in development work, aid agencies, consulting for uh, large development organizations um, like the World Bank, the ILO, IFC, et cetera. Um, I then moved to Myanmar, where I was part of a team that helped launch a mobile money into the company. And I did that for a few years, really exposed me to fintech and exposed me to like the, the miraculous world of payments. Um, after doing that, moved to Singapore where I was uh, working for Facebook back in the days where it was just called Facebook, right? We were um, working on connectivity initiatives, mobile money initiatives, payments, ton of a ton of energy. It really helped expose me to not just uh, fintech and payments, but you know the broader tech world and how um, tech can scale and it can how, how it can really impact people's lives, uh, especially when you're talking about. Um, providing like, you know, things like new tools and new software. Um, and, and that was really eye-opening to me. And while I was still in Singapore, I uh, started working for Stripe. Um, you know, I was helping them expand to new markets, uh, accept, accept new payment methods, et cetera. And it was 2020. Uh, my wife and I were in Singapore. My dad gives me a phone call and he says, uh, I have stage four pancreatic cancer. And the cancer um, had spread. And the news was, was really hard for us. Um, you can imagine... You know, it was kind of the worst case scenario in terms of uh, what we thought was going on. It was a few weeks where he's telling us I have stomach pains. I kind of just brushed it off. I was like, okay, I have stomach ache, whatever. It's you know probably nothing serious. Um, and then here our world was more or less turned upside down. So my wife and I were chatting. We were like, what should we do? Um, you know, what's what will make sense for us? We kind of take a step back. We think about our values and we're ultimately like, let's just go home and spend time with them. So that's what we do. Uh, we we go back to Virginia uh, where, you know, my, my I'm from, my dad was living at the time and um, move in with him and, and help him go to chemo, help him go to radiation, um, do our last father-son trips together. Uh, we also did all the logistics, right? Like I add myself to the accounts, cross T's, dot I's. Um, and we go through all that. He eventually goes to hospice. Um, and then eventually he passes away and he passes away. Our family is really overwhelmed with grief. It's really hard. It's really sad. Um, particularly with cancer, you know, the last final months, you can see them change physically. You can see them change emotionally. It's, it's a lot to take in. And, and so not only am I overwhelmed with grief, um, but here I was at the same time, completely surprised and shocked at how messy the, the inheritance and the logistics were for uh, dealing with him after he passed away. 
And to some degree, you know, he went through hospice. I, you know, I, I wasn't, I was, over, I was grieving, but I wasn't surprised by the fact that he passed away. But I was very, very surprised with how much work had to be done and particularly how much of it was offline and how much of it required in-person time and how much of it just seemed really antiquated uh, as compared to all the software and tools that we're used to today. Uh, like I have to go to and branch multiple times, uh, provide the same documentation over and over and over again. Uh, everyone has a slightly different form to fill out. You often feel like you're waiting in line. You often feel like you're on hold for like three hours while you're getting transferred in between departments. And I, I just couldn't kind of put two and two together. Um, and pretty much what I realized was this was a situation that was a lose-lose, right? I was losing out because I had this, you know, terrible experience. I have to go and branch, you know, phone calls, et cetera. It took me four visits over four weeks to get one basic checking account and then spread that across all the institutions I'm dealing with, right? And at the same time, they're spending a ton of time on my account. So this is obviously operationally heavy for them. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about this. I'm like, this is taking a ton of your time too. Like, isn't this frustrating for you? And and then finally, like the, the, the final piece for me, which kind of put everything together was they just gave me a check and I just walked out the door. And I'm not, I know, I'm not a wealthy person. I wasn't inheriting a ton of money, but I was inheriting more than the average deposits that they were holding. And here I am just taking a check and walking out the door. And when I met my co-founder, we were talking about, you know, different experiences we've had and ways that we want to help the world. We were thinking like, what is something that I've gone through? And I was like, I have just gone through this experience that felt like a lose-lose. It, it made no sense. And then we started thinking about, well, what does a win-win look like? What does it look like if an inheritor has an easy time and if the credit union can also be able to accept the documentation, spend less time for a deceased account, um, retain more of those deposits, keep more of that with the institution, is there a win-win where everyone is just better off? And we realized that this is a perfect case for, for software. Um, and that's that's where Ribbon came up. And that's where we decided that the inheritance platform was, was something that the market was really demanding. I think your story is very reflective of, you know, a lot of families out there. On a personal note, I just found out my dad was diagnosed with cancer about a month and a half ago. So we're kind of in that same process in trying to understand, okay, what are we going to do with, with finances? Um, th the same discussions as well about like future trips. But I imagine for me doing this, my impression is I'm doing all of this. So it's easier if God forbid it happens. What you discovered is at that moment, everything that you were doing before was just kind of uh, like 2% in comparison to everything that was waiting for you that was taking away from your time to grieve. Is that fair yeah, to say? Well, first of all, yeah. And first of all, I'm really sorry to hear about that. Um, obviously, Thank you. I appreciate uh, you know, it. they've been there and it's it's tough. And there's like a ton of things that I'm sure going through you and your family's mind at the same time. And, you know, my my take on this is, what I was sold is you do this work because it makes it is easy. When in the reality is you do that work because you would rather spend two years of time than four years of time. And what we should be asking ourselves is why is this two years of time? Now, you know, many cases it's less than two years. And on average, you find it's around 18 months to settle, uh, to settle in a state, but you still look at that and you go 18 months. Like what's, what's taking, is it, is it really just probate time in court? Like what's taking 18 months and you realize it's just a lot of paper cuts, you know, and that's at least what I realized on my side. So the work that you're doing right now, first of all, I hope that, you know, his cancer can go into remission. I hope that obviously he can get all the care that he needs, um, you know, and, and obviously I hope for a full recovery, but you do this work up front and everyone should do this work, by the way, regardless of, of whether or not they have any kind of diagnosis. You do this up, work up front because the expectation is that it's going to be uh, a lot easier for after, if and when the inevitable happens. Um, I just, I just found it surprising that no one was like, hey, it's still going to be 18 months plus to deal with all the logistics. And then once we started digging in deeper, it's like the why of the 18 months, we realized 18 months doesn't have to be the case. This is in all inclusive, end to end. This should not be more than a few months um, of work, especially, especially when you're talking about just the financial accounts, like just the checking, savings, IRA, 401k, whatever, that, that should not be more than a week. Um, there's no reason for it to be more than a week. But what's unique in, in your case as well is that your dad, uh, his financial institution was a credit union. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, well, and the, and the thing is, is, is he had multiple, like, like most Americans, he had multiple accounts. 
Um, and he had multiple institutions. So it is it is not just uh, credit unions that suffer with this. It's all financial institutions. Mm -hmm. You know, try try calling any bank and saying my loved one passed away. See, see what happens. I mean, literally, I, I ask any listener right now to to call a bank and just say, hey, loved one passed away. What do I do? You'll you'll realize it. You immediately start this maze that takes up hours of your time on that particular phone call. Um, they'll ask you for documentation. Um, oftentimes, it, you know, you fall into this bureaucratic hole where they realize later on that because of a certain setup of an account, there's a different form that's needed. And it's, it feels it feels like an infinite game of phone tag, um, as, and then let alone in branch visits. And the other thing I'll add on top of this is, you know, I'm grateful enough to say that I had a situation where, you know, I don't, didn't have kids at the time, uh, you know, I, I could take off time from work, et cetera. Most people don't have those options. They have kids, they have full-time jobs. Mm -hmm. Going in branch is actually really inconvenient for a lot of people's schedules. Uh, so the self-serve option isn't there. Um, so he had an account with a credit union. We also had accounts with a few different institutions. He actually had seven different accounts that we had to deal with. The average American has five, especially after COVID. We saw a lot of folks signing up for things like Robinhood and Coinbase. Um, money's all over the place. So you scale one bad process and then you take it across the financial industry. Next thing you know, people who are grieving are spending months and months and months to get basic accounts. When I think of a credit union, I think of that being a little bit more old school and they're still around. But I feel that yeah. a lot of people don't really notice that, like I, maybe the younger generation, at least, because I had to do my digging, you know, prior to this to be like, what are the what are the key differences? Can you explain that to us? Yeah. So at a very high level, a credit union is a not for profit organization. The members all pull in money into one organization called a credit union, and then they have shares in that in that credit union. So, you know, kind of think of like as a co-op, they all have they all have a stake in, in that um, that specific financial institution, a bank. For But on the other hand, is for profit. Uh, you know, you, unless you buy shares, you're you're not uh, you're not getting shares of a bank when you put money with them. They're just going to put money there and you're going to get um, interest back. From the perspective of a member or customer, credit unions call their their uh, their customers, they call members, banks call their customers, customers. Um, from the perspective of a member or customer, very similar financial products are there, but from a very different experience. And I think there is a reputation that credit unions are old school. They have a long history, especially in blue collar communities, especially in working class communities, especially in folks that wanted to like, you know, uh, like unions that wanted to pull their resources together. Um, think of it like, you know, everyone is working at the same factory uh, and they want to be able to like have their money put in the same place. They have a whole a long history in, in those kinds of environments. And then over the past 20 years, they've gotten a reputation for becoming old school because they haven't updated their systems fast enough. Now, to their credit, I would say the credit union industry over the past five years has really woken up. They're really trying to focus on innovation. And the thing that they're trying to do right now is focus on member experience and being able to provide the tools that pretty much folks across the U.S. have come accustomed to. And the final thing I'll say, this is kind of like more of an unofficial difference between the credit union and the banks is you'll generally find as a rule of thumb is that credit unions, because members are all part of it, right? Because you know, you're know you uh, quote unquote bought into the, the credit union when you, when you put your money in, you're gonna have a you know, member shares, for example, they tend to have a really good uh, relationship with the, the folks they know. It's, it's not uncommon to have a credit union uh, have like a member service representative that knows your name, knows your background, knows your history, uh, and folks who are part of credit unions like myself, uh, the reason we love it is because they offer a certain personalized experience, which feels really um, like the care. And that's one of that's also one of the reasons why we were really excited to, to, to partner with credit unions, because it feels like the last missing piece here is when it comes to those who are grieving. It's like they got a lot of the member experience stuff figured out, but they haven't quite gotten the, the what happens when you're grieving um, scenario figured out. Surprisingly, there's the same number of credit unions in the U.S. as there are as banks, roughly. So the numbers that I'm looking at here, it's a, I asked how many banks are in the U.S. And it says as of March 31st of this year, the FDIC listed like roughly 4,500 banks in total. And for me, I was under the impression that maybe credit unions would be less, but that's not necessarily the case. There's more actually, it's 4,600 uh, federally insured credit unions in oh, the U.S. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. They said those numbers are dropping every year, but it, it tends to be the same with banks. But they're also saying uh, the value of assets for these institutions continues to increase. Right. But what I think was very interesting that you mentioned, I used to work for a bank years ago, Scotiabank, and I worked in the branch. That was like one of my first jobs. 
Right. And what the best thing about being there was developing the relationships with the people that came in. And it was always an older generation of people. They wanted that oh, yeah. sense of community. And I, yeah. I swear, some of them were older people that would literally just take out the money to come back the next day and put it back into the account. But I always felt it was just the reason to come back to the bank and, and have that type of relationship. But what makes sense, and I feel like this is what you guys are doing, is you're basically automating the system for the credit unions in terms of, you know, helping with the, this process. Is that fair to say? Yeah. And, and I would say even at a higher level, it's replacing the conversation of paperwork and bureaucracy with conversations about products and services that are relevant to you. And if you, for example, if you're working at the branch and you want to have that relationship, a great way to have a relationship is to not be asking about forms, right? Like you, you should be asking, how's your day? If someone comes in and say, says like, I lost my spouse, you should be asking, how are they doing? How are you? Are you okay? 100%. You know, like, is, is, is everything okay with you? But you're in a situation right now where these folks working in the branch, these folks working in the deposit operations team, they're asking about, you know, do you have your letter of affidavit? Do you have your letter of intent? Um, is this a you know, death certificate? Do you have that available right now? You're asking about all this paperwork. And so what we're trying to do is exactly like you said, why not automate that paperwork? Because it's important, it's compliance and legal reasons. So you have to have it, right? Why not automate that and then be able to then instead have a conversation about things that are actually relevant? So you're offering that technology to the credit unions. How, do, how does that work exactly? So we go to the, uh, any credit union. And we say, here's a, you know, three things that we think are important for you. And let us know if you agree or disagree. First one is that folks who are grieving, members or non-members, when they come and they're interacting with you, they should leave away with the experience that was empathetic. You know, is the experience for, the, for, for your members and non-members important? Second one is, do you feel like you should be spending a ton of time on deceased accounts for your operations team? Or do you feel like your operations team has better things to do? And the third thing is, do you feel like right now with the great wealth transfer, with inheritance uh, uh, working the way it is, do you feel like right now like you're able to retain a lot of the great wealth transfer or are you able to retain the deposits that are being inherited from one generation to the next? If your answer is I care about experience, I don't want to spend you know, a ton of time on deceased accounts and I don't feel like I'm getting the full advantage of being able to participate in a great wealth transfer, then wonderful. Because what you can do is you can take ribbon software, take this widget, Put it onto your website. Also have a link that your call center or your branch can easily SMS or email out. That goes to the person who's inheriting. They'll be able to submit documentation and your team through an admin portal is going to get everything they need to one place to not just make decisions on the inheritance, but also do things like send flowers, send notes, uh, do the things that we think is important to maintain a relationship so someone doesn't just take a check and walk out the door. How do you really incentivize it? in terms of, uh, you know, trying to keep those people in the bank, right? Like you, you were talking a little bit about obviously the technology side, but what, what, what's the main thing that you do to keep those people from like walking out with that check from the door? That, that is a, such a great question. Um, so I'll say a few things about this. First one is, um, you know, we've talked to a lot of folks who've lost a loved one and it is like unanimous across the board, which is, if you just made me wait six hours on a phone call, don't you dare try to offer me some loan or product that you have right now. I don't want to hear it, right? It's a very emotional and visceral reaction you have. So you have absolutely no chance of maintaining that relationship if they just had a bad experience when they lost a loved one, right? So that's like table stakes. You need to be able to offer a basic human experience, an empathetic experience. Um, the second thing is, is you're not going to be able to retain anyone if you're not knowing who's coming in and when they're coming in and what accounts it deals with. And because right now it's fragmented and it's all in a bunch of different places, you know, you go to any executive of any financial institution, ask them, Hey, how many, how many of your members or customers passed away this month? Almost always, they don't know. They have to go check it out. So they don't actually know and have the details in front of them, the insights, the data to say, here's who came in, here's their situation, et cetera. Let's figure out you know, a playbook to be able to, to, to run. Um, third thing I would say is being able to, and, I, and I'll actually give a personal story for this, be able to give relevant promotions or products and services after that em empathetic experience. So like, what do I mean by that? Well, I remember I walked, and this is like a personal experience that, you know, we've talked to a lot of folks who've had something similar happen. I remember I walked into a branch and it was my fourth visit. 
you know, about a month of going back and forth because obviously I can't go every single day. So I'd like, you know, okay, I'll come back next week or whatever. You know, you get the death certificate. Okay, I got, I got this form filled out. Okay, I got a form. I'll, I'll do this later. Okay, I'm closing form. Okay, I'll bring that in later. Go through a whole process. Um, the frontline lady, she was helping me out. She's super lovely, really nice. And, you know, we're literally right about to wrap up, about to get a check. And I noticed there was a banner on the wall. It was like a promotional offer. It said, you know, get $300 if you do X, Y, and Z. It was like some basic, you know, requirements like direct deposit, et cetera. And as I'm sitting there, like time tapping my, you know, hands on the counter, waiting for her to like wrap up. I was like, hey, by the way, am I eligible for that 300 bucks? So I was like kind of going through the requirements. I was like, I'm pretty sure I can hit this. Like, I wonder if you just like kept it here and I just like went to like go get some food or something. I can just come back in a few months, you know, maybe I can get a few hundred bucks out of it. And she hesitated. She didn't know. So she's like, let me ask my manager. I'm not sure. And I was like, ah, you know what? Forget it. Just give me the check. So I take the check. I literally, I leave. She calls me 20 minutes later and she's like, wait, 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 you are eligible. You are eligible. But it was too late. I had already left. Like the check is gone. Right. So what I mean by that story is there are a lot of paper cuts that lead, that lead to churn. And there's a lot of solutions for retention. The most obvious one is run campaigns, run promotions for relevant products, great CD rates, a great auto loan rate, a, a, you know, a bonus for opening up a checking account. The things you already do, make it relevant for them. I would argue make specific ones based on their scenario, based on their accounts, based on how much they're in inheriting and run offers so that they know that they're eligible if they stay there. And most folks will take you up on it because they get to, it's, it's like a, the best case scenario for someone who's grieving. I got to save a ton of time. I got some money. It's in this account. I know it's safe. I can go deal with the funeral. I can deal, deal with other things in my life. Um, and that ability to run campaigns is we think like really critical to that retention piece. And then the final cherry on top is being able to do what we kind of consider like the, the cherry on top of, of experiences is, send flowers, send a note, send a chocolate. Like I, I often joke, like half my friends then send me flowers. How crazy would it be if a credit union send you flowers when you told them you lost a loved one? I mean, imagine imagine getting off like a, a big bank. Imagine like being on hold with Charles Schwab for like four hours, hanging up and then going to your credit union, submitting all your documents, getting your inheritance. And literally the next day you open the door and there's flowers there. Like the, the, the delta of experience is so high. So when we think about retention and how you can convince folks to stay, we think of an all of the above strategy because we don't think there's going to be a silver bullet to this. We just think that the whole way of, of inheritance needs to change. I think the word personalization has become so connected to things like social media, but I, I, for, I, I feel like we forget what personalization means in an experience, this interaction that's one-to-one -one, and what that means for them personally when they're interacting with, with, you know, like a large company. So those little details I feel make a world of a difference, leave a lasting impact. So from what I understand that ribbon's doing, it's not, it's not just uh, eliminating, you know, the, the paperwork, but it's, it's uh, equipping, I guess, the staff with the knowledge in terms of what to do exactly step-by-step -step, um, when, you know, you have a client that comes in and says somebody close to them had passed away, right? And you're and you're there to assist them. In more ways than one. Exactly. And we just don't think you can shortcut an empathetic response. Like if I tell you I lost my dad and you just send me a generic email that says sorry, like I, I'm gonna sniff the inauthenticity and I'm not gonna care. And it actually it might even rub me the wrong way. If I you know if I'm waiting on hold and you just have a generic AI message that says, I'm so sorry for your loss, I, I'm gonna sniff the inauthenticity. I'm gonna know you don't care. Right. And, I, and I'm not only that, I'm going to be really frustrated that you're giving me a bad experience while you're giving something inauthentic. So the question that we face at its core is like, how can you give that personalization, that one to one in a scalable way? And exactly like you said, it's about empowering the people who are already there to know who came in. How can I send you gifts? How can I make sure that I at the very least called you and told you in person, I'm sorry for your loss. Um, give them the tools to be able to give them that wow experience. I 100% agree. I know you've only been doing this for about a year, but have you heard any stories maybe that have connected with you? Maybe somebody like a, a credit union that you worked with specifically and maybe somebody from the branch that shared, you know, their experience of, of serving somebody that had just, you know, lost somebody close to them? Oh, so many. Um, so many. I mean, it, it literally uh, the CEO of one of the credit unions that, worked, that we um, uh, are working with uh, lost his mom. Uh, about nine months ago, 
and you know him just talking about like it, it, it's just it's not scalable you know it was like kind of like this wake up call for him where he was explaining like this is this is not going to work um, i've spoken to operations folks or folks on the front line who've told me that they've gotten yelled at um and they're like they're not sure what to do you know like they're they're sitting there they're like the worst day imaginable right like someone who is grieving who like lost their spouse has just screamed at you at the top of their lungs and you're sitting there crying because you're like it's not my fault i, I don't have the tools to be able to help you and so when i hear stories like that it really uh resonates on a very emotional level because you realize it's not the fault of the ops person it's not the fault of the call center right? Like there's no one here who's just like a bad person. We just have, we don't have the technology and the solutions in place to make sure that this is easier for everyone. And I think what we've seen, especially as we've done like a listening tour for credit unions across the country is they're just, they feel like they don't have the solutions in place to make this work in an empathetic way to the point now where I remember um, there are two different folks who I remember who told me something very similar, which is like, I'm almost scared to come in and hear that because I'm not sure what to do, you know? And that to me is a failure of a market. Like a market should then be providing a solution. Like then I was, oh, that, that's when a company should come in and, and provide a solution. Because when you're saying, I hope no one comes in today and tells me I lost someone because I don't even know what to do. I have to, you know, deal with someone who, who's crying in front of me and deal with the paperwork. The moment you hear that, the moment you go, okay, this is this is a place for technology to come and help out. Mm-hmm. So uh, I guess I want to end this by asking, uh, I was kind of interested a little bit in terms of what ribbon stood for. Okay, for some yeah. reason, I feel like, I don't know why I feel like it could be a metaphor for something. Do you mind, <laughs> do you mind sharing maybe where that name came out of? Yeah, yeah. We, um, if I take a step back, I think inheritance has become, it's a word that you understand to associate just with like money. And it's become this kind of like transactional term. And what I realized when I lost my dad was that his accumulation of life's work was handed to me as his last gift. It was his last gift to me, right? It was, he literally gave me a gift. And to me, it was like, this is the last gift that is being handed to me. What ties off the gift? And that's when we were like, Ribbon. That's, that's where Ribbon comes in. Wow. Okay. That's beautiful. I think what you're doing is beautiful. It's a very specific segment of a market, but I think it, you're, you're adding value to a community that that needs it. If somebody wants to get in touch with you and learn a little bit more about Ribbonware, um, how could they do that? Um, so our website is www.trustribbon.com. Uh, you can always reach out to us from there. And then um, th the best way to do it is just go to our website um, or you can reach out to us. Uh, you know, if you want to see a demo, we're happy to schedule a demo. Um, you can always uh, email me at saeed at trustribbon.com. Uh, I try to be very responsive to emails, although sometimes it can be it can be hard. Um, and we, yeah, just please reach out. We we love 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 hearing from folks. Sai, thank you so much again for joining us on this episode of Brains Bite Back. I'm wishing you all the success in the world in helping those at a time basically that they need it the most. Thank you so much for having me. It was uh, it was a real pleasure. Appreciate the chat. That's a wrap for today's episode. If you've benefited from what you've learned today, feel free to leave us a review on iTunes. You can also find all our past and future episodes on YouTube and Spotify under Brains Bite Back. And if you'd like to connect with us directly, you can always reach out to us by email at info at sociable.co. Remember, your feedback helps us grow. We welcome it. We appreciate you joining us. Until next time.